Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Ketogenic Fasting Project Gone Carnivore. My name is Tom, and today I wanted to talk about the basics, about getting started and not getting overwhelmed. A lot of people might just be interested in trying a low carb diet. Maybe you got some high blood sugar. Maybe you just want to drop a few pounds. Maybe you've got uh, some achy joints. Maybe uh, you have some other issues and you've heard stories about other people that have resolved them just by changing their diet. And, uh, you know, if you're in the, in that environment and paying attention to that, like I am, you're going to see new stories every day. Some of them are remarkable people, uh, with serious, uh, um, MS symptoms having trouble walking and stuff like that and uh, talking and taking care of themselves all the way to people who have uh, very serious emotional problems. You know, their, their depression is, is, is really bad. Their anxiety is really bad. Um, people have been on medications uh, for decades and they go on uh, a low carb keto carnivore a banting diet and things turn around for them. I think a lot of people, uh, you know, particularly in a low carb come to it originally just to lose some weight or maybe manage their blood sugar. But more and more in carnivore, we see a lot of people who have serious health conditions and, uh, or they were vegan and their, their conditions got worse or they, they got new conditions and they, they're trying the exact opposite and they can't believe how fast they start feeling better. But uh, there's a lot of information to cons consume. There's a lot of stories out there. There's a lot of techniques. I mean, some people uh, just eat leafy greens or something like that. Some people like myself just eat meat. Some people eat a little bit of starchy tubers or whatever. Um, so there's a lot of possibilities. That, that could work for a lot of people. And I try and tell people uh, not to get overwhelmed. Don't try too many things at once. Don't drastically change your diet and go from three or four meals a day with snacks down to one meal a day all at the same time. Unless you're just hardcore and you love experiments like that, but that's not a great approach for most people. Now, I myself, before I even went keto, I was already uh, constantly trying to improve my diet. You know, I wasn't just eating or wasn't just grazing fast food all day. I was actively eating lots of salads. I was buying, you know, lean meat like chicken breast a lot of the time. I was, uh, cooking, doing most of my cooking at home. I was already disciplined enough to take my food with me most of the time. Um, I was eating quinoa and brown rice and lots of spinach and kale and, uh, all that, all that stuff, thinking it was good for me. And all the while I was getting sicker, I was taking supplements, trying to improve things. I was, you know, supplementing with uh, whey, whey isolates and stuff like that when I was going to the gym. And I was still getting, feeling worse. I was putting on weight and I was struggling more and more at the gym. It didn't matter that uh, I was trying to do all these things right. And I'm not saying I had a perfect diet. Yeah, I still drank uh, soda sometimes. I still, uh, you know, I didn't really think much about it. You know, holidays came around and there was uh, chocolate or something or desserts or something. But I wasn't the kind of person who went out and bought candy or desserts for myself. You know, most of that was pretty incidental. Most of that just had to do with seasonal stuff. But, you know, like in the United States, you get in, you get close to Halloween and there's candy everywhere. And then before long, you're into Thanksgiving and there's still Halloween candy around. And then Thanksgiving comes when you're eating all kinds of stuff, mashed potatoes, sweet potatoes. Sweet potatoes often have brown sugar and marshmallows on them of all things. And even the cranberry sauce is loaded with sugar. There's tons of added sugar in that stuff usually. And then the stuffing, which is just made out of bread, you know. And then you get into Christmas and it's more, it's more cookies and pastries and candies and uh, people celebrating. And uh, so that whole stretch right there, it's no wonder people get to January and they're like, oh, I, got a, I need a new resolution. And I, I think the, part of the thing is January is coming up now because it's December, it's mid-December now. 
and people are going to make resolutions. And I say, if you're going to make a resolution, don't bite off more than you could chew to get started. Maybe say like for the first month, I'm going to cut out sugar or I'm going to cut out grain. I'm going to cut out vegetable or seed oils, something like that. Just start scaling it back. And then try uh, if you really, you know, keto works for a lot of people, but keto can be complicated because you not only have to hit macro goals, but you have to understand what those macros are. And that's one of the first things I realized I've talked to people. They really have a vague idea of what's in food. If, if you just start with the fact that um, you're only deriving calories from three primary sources, carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. And a lot of people say, well, you get calories from alcohol, you know, ethanol, which is, you know, the alcohol and whiskey and beer and wine and all that. That's true. Fortunately, most of us don't get the bulk of our calories from that because, you know, obviously if you're consuming a lot of alcohol, it's probably going to have a very negative impact on your health. But let's face it, people drink and understanding what you're drinking can be important too. And I did a I did a video a long time ago on alcohol because a lot of people were asking me, well, you know, what kind of calories, what, what alcohol is better and this and that. And let's face it, alcohol is not a health food, but a lot of people are going to choose to enjoy it. So I'll do a whole nother um, video on what I've learned about alcohol. But uh, keep in mind, you know, it's not good. And it often comes packaged with a lot of sugar. So beers have sugar in them, wines do. Some wines have a lot, some have very little you know, hard alcohol like whiskey and vodka by themselves don't have sugar in it. The alcohol does not turn into sugar. Uh, that's a common misconception, but they're still not good for you and they're still extra calories. So, you know, obviously moderation is good. So maybe those are the kind of goals you want to look at. I mean, a lot of people are used to this, like you knock off work, you go home, you have a beer or whatever, you know, I know craft brewing is huge where I live. It's been going gangbusters for at least a decade, maybe more. Even when I was when I was in college, I had all kinds of friends that brewed beer at home. You know, it was a hobby. It was a hobby. It was something people took pride in and people enjoyed sitting around having beer. I used to drink beer back then too. Everybody drank beer at that age when when I you know, the people I was around anyway. So I understand it's part of the culture, you know, and it's more prevalent in some areas than others. But uh, maybe those are the goals right there. Scale back that stuff. Because, uh, you know, fatty liver syndrome, whether it's non-alcoholic or alcoholic fatty liver syndrome, they're some of the most, they comprise some of the most common diseases. And when you get older, that's really going to show up in really drastic symptoms. But when you're younger, it, the, the symptoms aren't quite as noticeable. So making little changes like that. And I like to tell people, read some books or listen to audiobooks. Most of the books that you can buy like if you want to listen to Gary Taubes or something like that, he wrote a lot of good books about essentially the historic impact of food on populations, right? That's in the general sense. They're not really diet books. He doesn't say eat this and then eat that or whatever. He really looks at, at things from kind of a, a high elevation. He's looking down and saying, look, this, this food came in and became more prevalent and this is what happened to the people. This is how people suffered. So something like that's a good place to start. Not necessarily that Gary Taubes figured everything out. He would argue uh, primarily that sugar is the big culprit and he makes a strong case for it. But other people have made the, a very strong case that seed oils are really the devil in the details. So I think it's great that we're having that conversation. And I think they both have a serious negative impact on people and, uh, we may not realize that, you know, it wasn't until they figured out what to do with cottonseed, which was lots of this cottonseed left over from, from cotton production. They don't need as much seed as they produce. So it's normally not non-edible, you know, human beings can't digest it. So they figured out a way to make it edible. And that's where we got Crisco. Crisco is uh, crystallized uh, cottonseed oil. And everybody thought, well, you know, this is good for you, right? It's made from plants, but it looks like uh, it's really bad for you. And it's, it's slowly being taken off the market with a, along with a lot of other hydrogenated oils and seed oils and vegetable oils. And I, I personally, that soybean oil, canola oil, which is rapeseed oil, 
uh, corn oil, peanut oil, and all that. They're, they're not good for us, and we shouldn't consume them. If we do, it should be in extreme moderation. So uh, just like sugar and grains, and grains in the form of flour, processed flour, whole grain flour, it doesn't really matter. They may have impact us uh, the, to a greater extent the more refined they are. But uh, in general, I don't think they're healthy for us. And I was great. I was raised being told that whole grain was good for you, you know, and uh, I don't believe that anymore. And of course, the definition of whole grain, when you're looking at a package at the store and it says whole grain, what that really means can be very deceptive. I think it's, if you look into it, you find out it's very counterintuitive. It's not what you expect. So you might want to think about uh, uh, just starting out by learning something from a book or an audio book. There's lots of podcasts or videos on YouTube that you can watch for free. There's lots of groups. Uh, Sean Baker's new group, Meet RX, has a forum where you can join. I think they have some free membership coming up uh, so people can try it out. They have meetings where people come in on, in a Zoom call and people discuss these topics. Of course, he puts out lots of videos and he does a uh, Human Performance Outliers podcast. Lots of other people I know do podcasts. I Obviously, I do podcasts, you know, or put out video content. So I'd say make a point of, of learning and sort of educating yourself and don't just say, uh, give me a meal plan. I'm gonna change everything I do. I'm gonna stop on a dime and turn around and go 180 degrees in the other direction, unless that's the kind of person you are. If that works for you, fine. But I think for most people, you want to sort of uh, uh, understand it as best you can, because that's really going to help you. Um, that's going to help you uh, figure out what to do if you hit some sort of hiccup or you have some sort of question. You're going to under you're going to have some idea at least how to how to address that or how to look up the information or who you could ask. And there's lots of people out there who will help you if you ask them. So um, there's lots of people now on social media that are very accessible that, that you would think, uh, why would this person talk to me? I don't know them. They live in another country. And oftentimes you just politely ask them a question, they'll answer it or they'll refer you to somebody. It's, it's pretty amazing. So given all that, I would say just start trying to wrap your head around how to change your diet and why you want to change your diet. You know, what really makes sense? Because we're in, in a way, we're all victims of bad information. We've, I know I, I just turned 49, so call it 50 years of bad information. Um, practically my whole life, meat and fat has been... Um, vilified and we're supposed to eat plants and whole grains and all this stuff and I think the information is wrong I've, at least for most people I think that type of information is going to make people unhealthy and I know that uh, sounds kind of weird and kind of shocking um, but I didn't just go from uh, eating uh, what I thought was a healthy diet I mean really working at it and exercising five days a week religiously to all of a sudden uh, now I just eat meat it, there was a long transition in there. And uh, I, like to, I like to point out that I was really working on my diet before, before I went keto and before keto led to carnivore. And I've been carnivore for a couple of years now. And uh, I felt the best that I have my whole life. So, and I, I continue to see improvements and, and so do a lot of other people. Maybe it's not for everybody, but uh, I think most people could try it and see how they feel and see if their issues resolve. And uh, I think it is, it is obviously simpler than, than going on a, a ketogenic diet or something like that. But keto, keto was good to me too. So I'm not going to bad mouth it. And I've been a fan of fasting and stuff like that. I still am. And I still think it has its place. Um, obviously the ketogenic diet in special cases uh, can very specifically address uh, serious medical issues. So that's something worth looking into. But uh, take it one day at a time, you know, and set your goal on, you know, reading a book or joining a Facebook group or joining uh, some other online group or uh, just talking to somebody who has some experience with it and maybe set a goal of just spending a little bit of time every day 
so that it's it's in the forefront, you know, so that it's 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 sort of on your daily agenda to to learn a little more and understand it a little better, rather than saying, well, I'm going to go full carnivore, OMAD. Um, I'm I haven't worked out in the past or I haven't worked out recently, but I'm going to go to the gym every day. I'm going to spend an hour at the gym. Um, I'm going to completely change my eating schedule, completely change my diet, completely change my exercise regime, completely change my sleep routine. If you try and do everything all at once, it's probably going to be a little overwhelming unless you're a pure animal. I mean, some people really, really like diving into things head first, but I don't think that's, uh, that's necessarily going to be a successful, uh, a strategy for most people. So I, uh, I like to talk about the stuff that's going on, how good it's been to me, but, uh, I didn't get here overnight. So it was probably, you know, a good three years ago when I really started heading in a different direction. And prior to that, I was consuming the information that most people get, you know, you see articles about, Oh, this, this, uh, you know, plant, you know, spinach has this in it. Oh, did you know spinach has more vitamin C than orange juice? Oh, okay. But then when you find out that, you know, I'm on the spectrum, as they say, I, you know, I was diagnosed autistic and uh, you find out that um, autistic people notoriously have high oxalate levels. Now, most people have never even heard of oxalates. And most people think that eating spinach really has no impact. Uh, on your health other than a positive one um, same thing with almonds you know I live in California where a lot of almonds are grown and it's controversial because um, almonds are looked at as being very healthy but at the same time it takes 17 times more water to make almond milk than it does to make cow's milk and when you turn around and you go well the almonds are full of things like oxalates and phytates and stuff like that which are essentially for the most part anti-nutrients um, because they either block the absorption of nutrients or your body winds up using nutrients to counteract them so in the case of oxalates oxalates are the number one cause of kidney stones a lot of people don't realize that they think kidney stone calcium well really what's happening is the body is combining calcium with the oxalate to essentially neutralize the oxalate because oxalates tend to form crystals in the body and a lot of times those wind up in the kidneys those are the kind of things that uh, are common problems you know we've all known somebody with a kidney stone we all heard how horribly painful kidney stones are we've probably seen some really scary pictures of kidney stones but we don't know that eating almonds or spinach or something like that can actually cause kidney stones. And we don't know that they can actually rob your body of calcium because that calcium needs to be bound up with the oxalates. I had heard a long time ago, if you break your arm or something, you're mending a bone, you probably want to avoid foods like spinach. And I think even broccoli was mentioned. And I didn't understand why I didn't understand oxalates, but what's happening is you're eating, you might be eating a calcium rich food, but you're not able, your body's not able to utilize it to mend a bone or, you know, to improve bone density or something like that because it's being drawn out of your bones. So anyways, learning stuff like that helps make sense. I had a friend the other day that was, he, when we talked about low carb and carnivore and stuff on and off, and he's had some, some issues and uh, he's, he's tried it. He's tried avoiding uh, um, foods, you know, especially like flour and sugar and stuff like, and he noticed a difference. He wasn't having as much pain. And then I mentioned to him about oxalates and uh, he hadn't heard of them before. And, and Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to fully admit I'm, I'm relatively new to oxalates. I saw them mentioned in the literature as I was reading along, but it wasn't probably until the last year so that they were really, something that I started to understand and understand the, the impact that they were having on people. And I mentioned it to him and he looked it up and he's like, Oh my God, you know, it's really weird. I have a lot of these symptoms. And you know, if you, if you went from a normal diet where you're eating a lot of oxalate rich foods and then you stop, you do have the possibility and this only happens to a few people, but you could, your body could start expelling those oxalates. And he, so um, they call it oxalate dumping. So your body hasn't been able to process and get rid of these oxalates 
as fast as you've been eating them or consuming them or absorbing them. So then once you stop and your body's like, oh, I'm going to get rid of it, but it's getting rid of all these mature crystals that have piled up. It, your body stores them in the skin. It can store them in the muscles. They've been found in people's brains. And when I say muscles, I mean, they found large oxalate crystals in people's heart muscles. It's just weird stuff. Like you're like, you think, well, how could I never have heard of this before? But it's all out there. It's all study. This is, this is stuff that scientists discover and that we're just generally not aware of. So if you uh, want to get on a diet, you might just want to set your goal on tapering off stuff like this. Um, and if you're autistic or have Asperger's or something like that, you might want to strongly consider tapering off of the oxalate rich foods. I'm sure you can find a list of them. But that's just some idea. Like you don't necessarily need to go cold turkey on everything. As much as food can seem like an addiction, um, and it and it I think it's rightfully called an addiction in many cases. Sometimes the best thing to do is to start by eating the things you know you want to eat. So like in my case, let's say I'm going from keto to carnivore. I'm going from a plant, more heavily plant-based diet to carnivore. I might start just by eating one meal a day that's pure meat, right? I might just say, okay, I'm gonna have one meal. It's gonna be a steak, you know, it's gonna be a pound of steak or three quarters of a pound of steak or, I'm going to eat a uh, half a pound of um, ground beef or whatever. I'm going to eat some lamb chops, whatever it is. And just do that and then taper off those, uh, those other foods. Because oftentimes what happens is when you eat something like beef, that protein and that fat satisfies you. And it tends to quell the cravings for things like sugar and carbo other carbohydrates, um, so it becomes much easier to give up those other foods when you consume the, your target foods first. So if you sit down and you have a, you just eat a steak or some hamburger or whatever, maybe you're, I did a video on meaty chili or the other day, maybe you just want to eat that and not have anything else on, on your plate and you eat a big helping of that. You should be satisfied. You don't need to stuff yourself. You should just feel full and comfortable and have good digestion. And that's one of the first things people notice is they go carnivore. It's like, I don't get acid reflux anymore. I don't have heartburn. I don't, you know, and a lot of people take heartburn medication because it's a really common problem. Uh, it's extremely common. And the thing is most of those prescription and even now over the counter, a lot of those over the counter acid blockers, proton inhibitors, if you look in the recommendations, they're only supposed to be taken for like 28 days tops. Because after that, they create problems. After that, you, you become much more likely to get pneumonia and all kinds of other problems. So people don't realize it's their diet that's causing the acid reflux and the heartburn. It's the thing that keeps hernias from healing and so on and so forth. Because one of the problems with eating a heavy plant-based diet, processed food diet, is people tend to have poor tissue quality. Tissues don't regenerate and they're not as robust as they should be. So a lot of things don't repair themselves. And a lot of this acid reflux is really just because food isn't as digestible. It's not because your stomach acid is too high. Your stomach acid is supposed to be really acidic. It's supposed to be around 1.5, which is uh, acidic enough to dissolve most metals. Uh, and we, we as human beings, healthy human beings, have some of the most acidic stomachs. We're right in there with the uh, scavengers that eat, you know, carrions that eat, you know, rotten meat and stuff like that. And that's how it's supposed to be. When it's coming back up, that's because there's a, a problem with your diet or there's some sort of physical problem there. That's not supposed to happen. That's supposed to, your, your stomach is supposed to be lined with mucus that contains that. This is all a very expensive genetic adaptation. This is, this is why I, one of the reasons why I believe that we evolved to eat meat because we ate meat. We ate, we've been eating large, tasty ruminants for at least three and a half million years. And when we start eating all these other plants, the other problem is you go to the store, you go to that produce section, pick anything in the produce section, any vegetable, 
any fruit in there and do yourself some homework on it. Find out where it came from and how long human beings have been eating it. Because none of that, none of that was created by nature the way it is. Most of that food in the produce section looks and tastes and has the content not even remotely related to how, how nature created it. So you tell me why that stuff is so, so healthy. Do we really need uh, hormesis? Are we really supposed to eat plants so that we are poisoning ourselves on a minor level to create some reaction that makes us more re robust? Or should we just eat meat? Because people who just eat meat tend to be very robust. Uh, their immune systems to improve. Ask people who've been on a carnivore diet for a couple of years, and they'll tell you, "Yeah, I used to get seasonal allergies. I used to get seasonal flu. I used to get seasonal colds, just like everybody else. I usually got got those things whether I got a flu shot or not." And then you know what? I haven't been sick for a couple of years now. Really interesting. I still go to the same places. I still have people at the store sneeze on me. I still work with people who get sick. I still have people at home that are sick. I still go to the gym and there's people that are sick. And for whatever reason, I'm not getting sick. Now I'm not saying no carnivore is ever going to get sick again, uh, but uh, clearly the immune system seems to be working better and you seem to get sick a lot less. Knock on wood, I haven't been sick. Uh, so uh since i started so it's been it's been almost exactly two years ago i had a sore throat and that was it that was the last time so since then i have done a little bit have a sneeze here or there i had a stuffy nose and the fires are burning we had some pretty bad forest fires but uh i outside of that I, it's amazing because i used to take all kinds of medication i've done videos about all the supplements and allergy medications and all the stuff i went through with that now i don't take anything for that so anyways if you want to start out um don't do it all at once uh commit to learning and you know reading other people's accounts and stuff like that and wrap your head around it and then know what you want to do maybe pick some something that's bothering you to work on maybe uh you know see if you, you, you can uh, ask your doctor, like, you know, what do I got to do? Where would I got to be in order to back off on a medication or something like that? Maybe you're spending a lot of money on medication and it would really be life changing just to not have to, to spend a ton of money on prescriptions or something like that. So maybe set that goal, get your doctor on board to support you in this. You'd be surprised. A lot of doctors, when you walk into them with a solution for your problems, rather than going in there, asking them to fix you, a lot of them are actually uh, pretty uh, pretty uh, helpful. And uh, more and more doctors are understanding low carb, keto, carnivore, stuff like that. It's, it's starting to show up on the radar. They're starting to meet other people who've done it. They, you know, so see if you can recruit them as, a, as a, somebody to help you out. Um, and uh, when you have success, don't forget to share it with them. So. Anyways, I just want to tell people with the New Year's coming up, get involved in your own health for the future. You know, don't 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 just sit around and become an accumulation of injuries and illnesses. Don't don't just keep adding to the list of medications if you don't have to. Seriously, consider changing your diet. When you get the diet right, exercising is much easier you'll want to exercise you'll enjoy the exercise if you don't enjoy it at all it's probably because you're on the wrong diet so hey and a lot of people don't even exercise to lose weight they get on the right diet and they they trim down nicely and they get leaner and more muscular and they feel better and they're happier it's an overall sort of goal of improving your quality of life so Anyways, I just want to make a video, um, even though I talk about doing all kinds of crazy stuff, you know, ice baths and fasting and just eating meat and all that. Don't do, don't try and do it all at once. Don't get overwhelmed. Just uh, come up with a plan that works for uh, your own goals, which means you got to set some goals, right? But anyways, thanks for watching the Ketogenic Fast Project. Look out for more uh, simple cooking videos and some more videos on um, uh, the growing carnivore community. And come see us at Autistic Carnivores on Facebook or maybe join the Ketogenic Fasting Project on Facebook. 
And if you would uh, give my uh, videos a like and uh, sub subscribe to the channel, it really helps. I know it's been growing, growing steadily recently. So that golden number is getting to a thousand subscribers. And so I think I was about 380 and change. So and Autistic Carnivores is sitting right at 699 members right now. So the next member will be the 700th member. Hard to believe for a group that, that I thought would be like 20 people a year ago. But anyways, I, I appreciate you watching. I look forward to your input. And, uh, you know, if you got, got some questions about setting goals or you got some advice for other people, go ahead and post them in the comments. And if you've got ideas for more videos or how I can make my videos better or more helpful or something like that, just let me know. I'm always happy for a little feedback. Thank you. Feel better.